lots of soreness that lasts for a day or two or more than that. It means you went too hard and you went too long. And you need to judge it based off of that, not based off of what you could handle before. This is where a lot of people mess up is they say, yeah, I know I'm getting real sore, but uh, I've done way more than this in the past and I felt okay. And it's like, well, it, it depends on what's going on right now with your life, your age, your diet, your sleep, your stress, all those different things. The best metrics you can use that will tell you if your workouts are doing good are the more objective ones, performance, strength, mobility. Um, are you actually progressing? Not are you feeling hurt or, or well, inflamed? What's up, everybody? Here's the giveaway for today's episode. Our newest program, MAPS Symmetry. Build a balanced aesthetic physique using things like isometrics, unilateral training, and even five by five strength training. This program has it all. It's our newest program, very popular, and you can get it for free. Here's what you got to do. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Also, by the way, go check out Mind Pump uh, podcast clips. We have a new channel with just short clips. That's another thing I want you to do. And turn on notifications. Do all those things, okay? If you do all those things and we like your comment, we'll notify you. And then you might win Map Symmetry absolutely for free. Also, we're running a sale this month on a workout program bundle and on an individual workout program. So the bundle is the Shredded Summer Bundle. This includes MAPS Aesthetic, MAPS Hit, MAPS Prime, and the Intuitive Nutrition Guide. So we took that discounted bundle and took an additional 50% off. And then the individual program that's on sale, if you just want to try one program, it's MAPS Hit. This is High Intensity Interval Training. Short, intense, calorie-burning workouts, okay? That is also 50% off. So if you're interested in either one of those, go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code JUNE50 for that discount. All right, here comes the show. Look, if you get really sore from your workouts, I hate to break it to you, but your workouts actually suck. You're doing it wrong. <laughs> I know. It's so opposite from what people think, right? They think yeah. if they get really sore, it's like the greatest workout of all it's time. It's the badge of honor. Right? It's. I remember as, uh, as, a, as a young kid working out, I thought getting sore meant I had a great workout. So I'd actually chase after that. It wasn't until I really figured things out, my body really started responding. That soreness... I actually had very little of it to, or none at all. And that's yeah. when I had the best progress. And that's what I would aim for with my clients later on is, did you get sore? Yes, I did. We went too hard. Let's bring it back. I especially bit. remember that when I was trying to like isolate body parts and was doing more split routine stuff. I was like, if I did not get that targeted muscle group, like insanely sore, or it was like, I couldn't even use it anymore. I felt like it was a total waste. Yeah. Yeah. I, know. Yeah. I think, I think that's uh, most trainers. I think most trainers are guilty of this too. I mean, it was at least a decade of training clients that I, I trained them this way. I trained my, and I, once I realized it with clients, I stopped there, but still like an asshole trained myself for probably five more years. Oh, like I know. That. Isn't that funny? Before, <laughs> before really starting to piece it together, you know, but I think, uh, I think a lot of people are guilty of this. And I do think that it's, uh, it's easier said than done too, though. Right. Like, I think it's real easy to sit here and be like, oh yeah. Okay. Getting that sore is too sore. Okay. Well then where's the sweet spot at then? Like, how do I know I'm having an effective workout right. if I can't feel it afterwards? And so, you know, it's still to this day, I'd say I, I, I'm flirting with that line all the time. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, I want to be clear, a little bit of soreness is okay. You know, the kind where you have to kind of stretch to search for and go, okay, I you can, can feel You can still that. move and function, yeah. Yeah, um, but lots of soreness that lasts for a day or two or more than that it means you went too hard and you went too long and you need to judge it based off of that, not based off of what you could handle before. This is where a lot of people mess up is they say, yeah, I know I'm getting real sore, but uh, I've done way more than this in the past and I felt okay. And it's like, well, it, it depends on what's going on right now with your life, your age, your diet, your sleep, your stress, all those different things. The best metrics you can use that will tell you if your workouts are doing good are the more objective ones, performance, strength, mobility, um, are you actually progressing? Not are you feeling hurt or, or well, inflamed? I kind of liken it more to an event or a game, like uh, that type of mentality. Um, it would be like I was competing every single time I was in the gym. Uh, if I was trying to achieve that type of soreness and, and stress uh, response that you get afterwards, and it's just not productive because it's a long game. It's a long-term strategy where you need to be able to think about what – I'm going to feel like in my next workout and the workout after that and the workout after that. And once you shift into that mindset, it's totally different. Yeah. I think another reason why this, this prevails or it's just so, so tough to get around is that we confuse recovery with adaptation a lot, right? So recovery is healing 
So it's your body healing. Adaptation is above and beyond that. That's where the body, once you're healed or even through the process of healing, because some often they can happen kind of at the same time or they overlap. The adaptation process is aiming to make you stronger, more resilient, so that next time that same stress doesn't cause the damage. But we confuse the two, right? So we think if we're sore and then we're not sore, that we actually improved. When in reality, oftentimes, all we've done is given our body the ability to heal, and then we go back to the gym and we repeat the same thing. So you never get stronger, you never improve. All you do is damage and heal, damage and heal, and we don't allow for the adaptation to take place. And if you think back to your your best periods of progress in your workouts, you probably didn't feel tons of soreness, right? If you can think back to when you were making the best progress, most consistent progress, you weren't feeling tons of sore. You, you felt yeah, you good. stronger and more energetic. You didn't yeah. feel like beat up. Yeah, well, so I think this different. gets abused the most at the beginning of someone's journey. And so I would actually challenge what you're saying right now too, that I think some people think that um, some of their best results come at the very beginning, right? You go from being sedentary, you're not training, right. not working out. You all of a sudden decide I'm, I'm extremely motivated and I'm going to, I'm going to do it all right. I'm going to start eating better. I'm going to train every day that I can in the week. I'm going to get after it in the workouts. Like I'm all fired up because it's the beginning and the results tend to come on pretty fast because you went from pretty much doing nothing to all of a sudden I'm going to be training every day that I can and then making better food choices. And so I think they see this change. So I actually think that uh, this gets abused the most at the beginning. And I also think that because um, this is somewhere I still struggle today, right? Like I always have to remind myself if I, I have fallen off a little bit of my consistency that when I get back on my kick of, okay, because I'm, I'm no different than anybody else. I have my moments of like where I'm not super consistent and then I'm really consistent and I go, okay, I tell myself, okay, I've, I've been falling off a little bit. I'm going to really tighten my game up this week. And what I always have to remind myself is when I when I get back into that consistency that I can't pick up where I just left off yeah. maybe say a month ago. Even if I haven't like fully like I haven't fully fallen off, like I haven't not trained at least a couple times in a week for a really long time. But if I also go, I'm gonna go from one or two times a week, I'm gonna ramp it up, I'm gonna start getting more consistent four or five times, I wanna be more consistent and, and finish my workouts or whatever the case may be. You, I take that mindset and I and I start to train that way and it's always a mistake because I didn't need that much. Yeah, I didn't have to do that many sets. You're overthrottled. It, yeah, all, almost always. And so it's I, I'm constantly having to have that conversation when I get but when I get motivated to come back in. So I think this happens to a lot of people when they get started. Yeah, really good point mm -hmm. uh, because uh, you know like back to what you said about the beginner, your body improved in spite of the fact that you did too much, right? So this happens too when you change your workouts or you change your phase. So you go from low reps to high reps or long rest periods to short rest periods or vice versa. And then you get really sore because yeah. you made that change. And then your body progresses and you're like, oh, it's because of the soreness. No, it's because you changed the stimulus. The soreness told you that you probably did a little too much, but you progressed in spite of the fact that you did a little too much. So don't confuse the two, right? Yeah. Don't confuse the two and say, this is that why is a I common progressed. association. Yeah. It's an easy association. Yeah, e easy to, to, to think in that direction because like this is what happened every time I shift yeah. it. And so I need to keep feeling that. Dude, soreness. I feel bad for my early years clients as a trainer because they would, I would ask them, Hey, how'd you feel after our workout? Like, Oh, you know, I felt pretty good. I'd be like, did you get sore? Me? Eh, not really a little bit. And then I'd like ramp up the intensity and push them. <laughs> Where, and then it became the reverse I later feel on. Like every trainer is guilty of that. Yeah. Man. And then it became the reverse the later on. Beginning. Like, Oh, I got really sore. Like, okay. We got to scale things back. It was too much. Yeah. So opposite from, you know, how I used to train people. Well, training. that's part of the problem is that clients think they need that. Trainers get competitive with that inside the gym. And it, it just makes, it just creates this cycle. I know. That, and I mean, I would make the case that probably most these, these big, these big public gyms with, you know, 10, 15, 20 trainers in them, I don't know, 80% are probably being trained pretty poorly, Yeah, you know? And not realizing it because maybe you see people getting results or there's somebody listening right now. Oh, my trainer was amazing. We got great results. You know, well, was that more because you had great programming and you trained correctly? Or is that because you decided to be consistent for the first time in your life and you had an appointment you were paying for and you were eating better for an extended period right, of time? in spite of. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. It's like sometimes, it, and so they attach that to, oh, this was great. When it's like, it could have been even better. You Absolutely. Know? And it could have done maybe less work. That's the crazy part is like, you probably could have put less effort and work towards it and had as much, if not more, results doing it the right way. Totally, totally. Hey, I got to tell you guys uh, about uh, yesterday. So uh, obviously it was a weekend or whatever, and I had one of those moments as a dad where you you just 
I, I swear to God, man, I must, I had to like pause five or six times for, because I was getting kind of emotional, you know, with my kids and stuff. So <laughs> this, if you're a parent, you can, this, this will relate. Cause it's a hard job, right? Being a parent's a hard job. Yep. And every once in a while, especially when your kids get older, they'll express to you, um, you know, kind of what you mean to them or what you've done. And then you just like, ah, it takes you back. So anyway, Jessica's not going to be around for Father's Day. So she's going to be out of town. So what she did is she had Father's Day for us yesterday or for me yesterday. So I show up and, you know, she booked this, this, these people to come and cater food. And we had some people over and the kids, and this is really cool because they know that I'm, I'm not like a things person, like to buy me things is really hard. Cause it's not, and it's also cause I'll just buy something for myself if I want. Mm -hmm. So they did a bunch of sentimental things. So my kids all wrote cards and what, what they wrote in the cards, like really hit me really hard. They did these post-it notes on this on the door and each post a note like was written by the kids for something that they appreciate me for, which you could tell it was like super heartfelt and thoughtful. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, dude. <laughs> I <laughs> was you. Oh bro. I couldn't even I couldn't even, yeah. I couldn't even I mean, like my son wrote my oldest, right? He he wrote a card and he drew like a bicep on it and a flexing or whatever. And on the inside he wrote, um, your greatest strength has always been being a father. Oh, oh wow. fuck. Uh, <laughs> he's, he's actually one of the editors of the show. So, okay, wait. So it was I'm going to tell him I love you, son. That was really good. But. It was on, uh, like you said, on the door? And so on the door were all these post-its and that, that was his card. So on the post-its were things like, um, you know, all the things they love about me. Oh, uh, okay. So like, uh, you're, you're a super involved father. Or, uh, you know, you love, you love to make us breakfast in the morning or, you know, you, uh, you, you do, you do good things for a lot of people, like mm -hmm. all these different things that they wrote. And, oh, cool. and I didn't know that they were there. So I go in, they go and Jessica's funny. She put them on the bathroom door cause she knows that's where I'll go first. Yeah. So I go and I see all these post-its. I ignore it. So I'm like, whatever, I go use the bathroom. <laughs> then I come out. He doesn't even say anything. Yeah, I'm like, oh, it's something, you know, she's writing notes for something or whatever. Yeah, she's yeah. always got some project going on. So I'm like, whatever. <laughs> so then think. she's like, Hey, did you look at the door? I'm like, was that for me? So I go back and I look at it and it just yeah. ruined me. <laughs> totally ruined me, dude. That's I funny. Said, oh, yeah. So much. We got to spend some time uh, over the weekend, uh, you know, with, with Domenico. And it was, I got to talk with him and he was, uh, I was like, maybe he would write this, right? Like, thanks for introducing me to Rocky, dad. Oh, yeah. But he only saw Rocky four. Oh, yeah. I was like, what? Yeah. This was mind blowing to me. I'm yeah. like, this is <laughs> your Sal Stefano's son. You've not seen all the Rockies. No. You know why? We got to do something about this. You know this. why? I want to, it's such a special like movie for me. Yeah. That I want to wait till so he they ask, ask for it. <laughs> I don't want to do the thing. Have you done that with your kids? Where there's a movie no, that you love as a kid? I them all to watch it really young. Yeah. All my Star Wars movies, all of them. So have you had this happen where there's like a movie that you really liked as a kid and then you kind of force them to watch it and they don't yeah. like it? It's so crapped out. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So, well, yeah, that does suck. I don't want to set that up because you know? if they don't like Rocky, I would be. I'm like, I don't know if I if I can keep you as a kid anymore. I don't know what we're gonna do here. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, dude. <laughs> so I matter. actually watched um, Top Gun finally over the weekend. I know ah, you've seen it, yeah. right? Oh, was it good? What'd you think, dude? I loved it. First like five minutes, right? Yeah, it got <laughs> me hooked. I mean, they didn't even bother to use any new soundtrack. Yeah. <laughs> That's so what I was saying. like, dude. <laughs> I'll take it though. Do you, you know, know that 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 movie's uh, getting close to 400 million domestic? Wow. Yeah. It's like, what are some of the records? I can't remember the last time I looked. I don't know what the records are, but it's, uh, I mean, definitely the top grossing movie in Bro, a long time. It's by far. really good. Like yeah. they, they nailed it. Like they did a good job of like, um, kind of taking you back to some of the clips and bringing, you know, that kind of energy back into the movie. And then the new characters being kind of similar, like, you know, hot shot guys and girl. And, yeah. uh, so it, it was a really fun movie, but one thing that I like noticed, I'm like, why don't I like this? Especially like it, it left an impression on me. <coughs> and, uh, I was thinking about, and this, you know, might somewhat, you know, be a, a bit of a spoiler, but so don't listen if you don't want to, but if you haven't seen it yet, come on. Uh, so at the end in the sequence, it's like this whole mission for them to like blow up this, this uranium base. Okay. Right. And it literally is the same scene as a new hope where Luke is going in with his rogue squadron down to blow up the oh. Death Star. And like, I, I didn't realize it. I walked away and I'm like, dude, this was really similar. 
and then, then I looked it up and like saw all these threads about it and stuff. But like, did it make it, you like it more or less? I, more. Uh, yeah. yeah, I was like, because like that's the thing. It's like Adam brings this up sometimes uh, about the hit makers, the, the book, because like they bring some of those elements of of familiarity and like things that I'm like, oh wow, like I loved this part of that movie, and then they like put that in. I don't know if they did that. Consciously or subconsciously? Totally cautiously, bro. I mean, we're right. Isn't that? I think it's funny how we are such creatures of habit when it comes to things like that. We're so predictable. Totally. It's like wait. So I, I, my initial, I loved it too. Like I really liked it. Um, but I also like recognize like, oh my, I just got wheeled the nostalgia, right? Yeah, That's it's the nostalgia. I mean, were I, you calling I, yourself out? I like, was, why am I getting the chills? Totally. Oh, I, know. I, yeah. I was like, I'm sitting with Katrina in the first. Literally, it's the first three. It's the intro, and I'm like, I look over, and I'm like, this is gonna be good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not even thing. an original intro. It's no. the same intro they did before, but it just shows you how easily. Yeah. I, I mean, so it, it could have been bad after that, but I was already suckered into it being good. It just shows you like, have you, we're so predictable. It's I, like, I know what I'm going to give dude. these guys. <laughs> I was like leaving like all just, yeah, because I was saw it with my kids and, and Courtney and, and like, I was like super pumped. And I'm like, like, so I'm reading immediately. I text uh, Major Jason, the guy that took me up because I was like, dude, like, there's no way Tom Cruise See, I'd be afraid 10 to tell them. <laughs> yeah, I'd be so afraid to tell them because they probably ruined it for you. They're like, no, that's he not He hasn't real. even seen they it still. It. Oh, they haven't seen it? No, he's. I'm like, you got to go see it, man. Like, I need your take on this. Like, No, I feel yeah. like they're going to ruin it. They're going to be like, you can't do that. Come on, That bro. wouldn't be possible. Like, Tom, possible. You ever this is, yeah. I know I know Hollywood tricks and all that, but like, I know like, so Tom Cruise has actually been able to uh, fly those jets himself. Like, he has like a license or whatever. Have you guys read oh, about he does? I'm pretty sure. So okay. have you guys read Good about the, Scientology? The, uh, the, <laughs> the open doors. Yeah. That's, do what, that's what I hear. Have yeah. you read about the impact Tom Top Gun had on uh, recruitments for oh, the Air brought, Force? You told me what it was. Oh, what was the percentage so, of that? I don't remember. I heard Navy <laughs> went like through the roof. Oh, it was this. it was massive. Yeah. It, it was the first one had a f tremendous impact on recruitments. This one. Also, it's probably going to have the similar impact, and I wouldn't be surprised. So, other people don't know this, I, but I've read something out there. If Hollywood produces that, a military movie or a war movie or a movie that has the they military, they get funding from them. If you if mm -hmm. they like it and they approve it, you can get funding for it because it acts like propaganda. It is. I mean, it's. I mean, I got pumped about it. Like, so, do you even, know they got funding? I I have no idea, but I Find I wouldn't be. Doug, I'm curious. I haven't watched the movie, but I wouldn't be surprised based off of what I heard because it's very pro. Pro America. Now that pro being Air said, Force I didn't Force. get that feeling. Like some movies, you really get that feeling. Like it's like this is totally like a, a recruitment type. Of, I don't get. I didn't get that from that. Did you get that from? I that? don't watch it. Oh, you don't. Did no, you get that? No, no, no. It just was a follow up. Of if anything, the, I feel like it played more into what Justin's saying. The the nostalgia of watching all the original. Nostalgia. Yeah, it just it's built like, on top of it. Yeah. So I feel like it was more that than anything else. But I mean, of course, seeing the, the fighter jets and. Well, the, let me ask you this: Would it make you, if you were watching it, would it? Is it something that would make you go, man? I think I'd want to try that or i'd want to fly one of those jets or maybe I'd i mean if enroll. you're yeah if you're a young buck i'm sure it made an impression like that on some of them sure you know because like I, I was i was all gung-ho dude when i was like you know full testosterone and teenager like ready to take what on it, the world what does this say here equipment but, include, oh that's not a big deal they got equipment as far as i don't jet. think they got any money for it no uh, but i mean hold on but if if you let's say you want to have uh military equipment whatever that could be very expensive. Very expensive. But if they like what you're doing, they'll give it to you for free. Look up. So look that's up how many, like how much it raised uh, recruitment for. I the thought Navy. Sal said something like pretty sure it was up crazy. Like pretty high. The original one definitely boosted it. I, I don't know if they have any numbers yet on the on. Uh, the it was the first one. I think one. they do. Yeah. I think they have it for the second. It was one the now. first one that did it. No, uh, I mean, I mean, you know, it makes a huge difference to watch movies and get hyped about shit like that. You know? Yeah. So yeah. you know what's crazy about it is when I when you came back from riding with uh, with the uh, you know the gentleman that took you up on the yeah Major Jason now which one did you fly were you in is it Tomcat was the F fourteen F sixteen F sixteen okay uh, when you told me how the G's affected you yeah that makes me it just blows me away how these guys can operate these planes these jets and know what they're doing yeah and you could tell too like uh, that the actors had to go through that because of their face and everything in the movie they zoomed in on, and you could see them like contorting uh, and contorting stuff. and compressing and I actually really enjoyed how they like highlighted that like th th that was like part of the, the movie was like you know how many G's they could pull and so that was like kind of the uh, I guess it made me feel a little better like when I went because the thing is, like in I guess in the, in the Navy, like they don't they don't have like uh, the G suit, 
when they fly. Like at least the um, Air, Air Force. Force. The, no, Air the Force. Air Force has a G suit. Right. The Navy has like the um, the Blue Angels. Like they don't use the G, so they have to like use this certain technique. Where, like <laughs> they, they breathe and tighten at the same time. And so why 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 not? Why well, I don't understand why why would one use a G suit and the other one not use? A G I don't know. Suit? Yeah, it's a good question. Have oh to wow, find that yeah. out. But oh, that's interesting. I'm sure like when they're actually in battle or whatever, like I'm sure they all use the G yeah. suit, but like it's so the, the whole thing was like trying to pull as many as they can with this like upward trajection for like 10 G's or whatever. And it yeah. was like, how many did you hit? I hit 9.3. Oh, so, so you actually reached nine something. Yeah. I remember oh, Justin. Wow. Well, he and that was such a big deal for them to hit 10 in the movie. Well, That's what I mean. That's why I was like tripping out. I was like, Oh dude. Yeah. Cause I felt, like I got smashed, you know, and like it was a total <laughs> surprise for me, like because I just getting thrown into that. Like. So there, okay, I, I, this isn't really a spoiler, but there's a part where one of the guys is is pulling t ten Gs, and his vision mm -hmm. tunnel, yeah, it, tunnel vision. Goes. Did you feel that ever? Did you ever feel like no? Because of the G suit, so the G suit keeps like pumping and squeezing your legs to push the blood back up. So that way it goes back up to your I head. remember when you came back, Justin's list, his quote was, I'm like, dude, what did it feel like? And he goes, it feels like it tears every atom of your body apart and then puts it back together. <laughs> I'm like, wow. That's fun. That sucks, I was dude. being dramatic. Yeah. <laughs> well, no. I mean, if you there's, you can go on YouTube and you can watch. They have these G simulation uh, devices that to, to test Gs on people. And, mm. and, they'll, and they'll have a camera on the person's face. Yeah. And it looks... Bad, bro. It does not look. It looks pretty bad. Yeah. Like, so the worst part is like my. It's been long enough now where I like I forget about the pain and I think about like how cool it was and like you know and I'm, I get all competitive with it because I'm like if Tom Cruise can do it, I was like, <laughs> if Tom I take I was still texting Major Jason. I'm like, hey man, like if that's true, like you need to take me back up, dude. I don't want to smash his record. Oh was, yeah, I was. It, it, he came back and told me about it, and I was I was dying because <laughs> Justin was talking crap. <laughs> so oh, that was, was the other thing. He so went in talking crap. I, I, so I know they were like, let's see what he yeah, let's I see downplayed he exactly. Like I downplayed a lot of the um the beginning of when I was like about to take off in the jet because I was just I what I do when I'm scared is I like pretend that I'm not, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just talking all this shit. Like I think that's everybody just yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what I do, right? And so I'm Hell like, no, I would have told them. Can shit. you slow down, please? <laughs> Can you just I'm not like, do that? Dude, you better give me like the, the craziest ride ever get anybody in this plane. And I'm like, <laughs> like I don't like this isn't is gonna be shit. You know, like you know it's like it's like the, the client coming up the first time. You better work my <laughs> ass harder than anybody's <laughs> exactly. ever worked. <laughs> exactly. You sure you want that guy? I feel like he took all the stops on me dude and uh destroyed me yeah. so you need to put job. uh a clip up again it's been so long it's been a few years now well, he puked it? at the end yeah yeah just you need to you need to put your, your yeah and you so get, that that haunts me a little bit but that was like so long i was up in the air like that if i would have gone back to the ground that would have been fine are you still talking shit it was, like a, it was like a, it was like an hour right it was yeah, close to an hour birds and shit we even in land. top gun those are only like 15 minute missions yeah you know what i'm saying they didn't do no no yeah, hour i i, <laughs> I wouldn't lasted 10 seconds yeah that would have made me vomit and really it was like I'm the barrel rolls that got I'm me jealous. it was like when you kept like flipping like this have you seen so i showed you guys oh, oh. I, I showed you guys that experimental like it's not a slingshot but it's designed to launch things into orbit through centrifugal mm. centrifugal force mm -hmm. so it spins them so fast and it releases at the perfect moment using no propulsion and it literally throws it fast and hard enough and slingshots it up to where it goes into space and then i read an article that said you know why humans can't you know, get on that thing. Like the G's would be so powerful. Yeah. Pancake you. No, it would rip. You'd splatter yeah, into the. It walls. would rip your Crush skin and yeah, your bones your apart. Yeah, and, yeah, they wouldn't be able to do it. <laughs> yeah, but they're, they they may use it for satellites because it's it would be cheap. It would just zoop and oh, launch yeah. up in the air. That's funny. How crazy is that? Yeah. The only way it's possible, by the way, because I read this, I'm like, why haven't we done this before? It sounds like like such simple, you know, physics. Mm -hmm. Because you need perfect, uh, perfect computing. To release at the perfect moment. Yeah, right. If One it's small a degree. Fraction off, and it's going to be so. <laughs> you, end up, yeah. you end up throwing it across the country and yeah. land somewhere. Yeah. And it explodes, you know? Whoops. I know, pretty crazy. Anyway, yeah. Doug did pull it up 500% increase. 
in uh, in recruitment. That was, the original, that was from the original. From the original. original. Oh, okay. So yeah. at this point, the Pentagon is just hoping it's going to do something yeah. similar. Hope it's going to. But they have no numbers yet. Okay. Oh no, nothing. Yet. I yeah. Got you. I got you. Oh, oh, you were. I thought you were talking about the original. No, the original. Oh. Yeah. yeah. We oh. don't know yet because the new one that just came out. Well, what a worthless stat for you to bring up of the old. No, one. because the old it's one. So, we'll see what this one like, does. It's, it's 15 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> you know that they're. Hey, you know that they're Throw creating. All off. You know that they're creating, or they have now supersonic drones. Yes. So they I now have this. yeah autonomous drones that are that go f- pretty soon they'll be faster than any plane that we can fly. So they were trying to kind of like pin that to some of the UFO sightings as oh. of late because the supersonic drones do they defy a lot of physics in in some regard. Like, well, that looks like it. It looks like it. Yeah, yeah. it's like an optical. Did I, did I tell illusion. you? So I, so I had a conversation. So we listened. Uh, uh, my son and I on the way up to uh, to Tahoe, we were listening to. Joe Rogan and Michio, Michio Kaku. Uh-huh. Yeah, so he's that, that astrophysicist, that really smart, a theoretical physicist anyway. He was talking about UFOs and you know the, the videos that we have now showing their maneuvers. And we're having this huge discussion, like, do you think it's aliens? What do you think it is? And I said, my theory is that it's our way of flexing our technology to the rest of the world sure. without telling them it's our technology. So we'll release it and be like, we don't know what this is, Russia, but isn't it weird? Well, that's what most wars <laughs> are is to, to <laughs> look how cool flex are. your yeah, weapons. Dude. Yeah, Because you don't want to tell them like, this is what we got. Yeah, yeah. So you want to be more like, man, this is weird. We filmed this thing going underwater <laughs> and flying crazy. <laughs> well, because I heard, that you, yeah, Russia has been using those supersonic drones to to bomb yeah. certain areas yep. and locations. Already. So oh, they're really? Already yeah, using they're using new in, technology. In oh, I didn't know that. That's, yeah. what, that's what the reports say. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. So, so yeah, yeah, but it's yeah, it is totally part of that is like all of a sudden I see all this new technology kind of surfacing and yeah. and you know there's you know war kind of brings all that out I would think totally. So I'm gonna make a little bit of a uh, of a left turn here, but I wanted to bring That's up right every time you say that you well, go right. I know I you know. say I'm gonna make a left turn and he goes right. Well, I think if you're watching me that way, <laughs> it, this is your left. Am I doing that it right? Drives Doug? me crazy. Is this left to you right here? On I'm the gonna, camera, I'm gonna yes. Take a left turn. Wax right on, wax listen, off. Listen, <laughs> say, he's thinking ahead. I'm, I'm talking to you though. I'm I gotta look at you do it. <laughs> I'm presenting. <laughs> left think NASCAR, Adam, dude. Always, always left. Always. But anyway, so I'm gonna make a whatever we want to call it turn, but it's definitely not related to what we just talked about. What a dick. No, so. So I was in our MP, uh, our uh, MP Hormones Forum, and I, I'll go on there and read people's questions yeah, and yeah. stuff. And <clears throat> I've been doing a lot more reading about hormones and the effects on the body. Actually, what, what prompted what I'm about to talk about was that, and I also read an article on birth control for women. And they're now saying, and this, of course, I think this is a duh, but they're talking about how <clears throat> birth control has been connected to uh, depression and anxiety in women. And for a long time, they didn't really want to acknowledge that this is a thing. But they're showing, hey, look, certain birth controls can definitely cause really bad depression in women and anxieties and whatever. Obviously, right? You're, right. It's hormones. But so I read that. Then I'm in the forum and I'm reading people's questions and stuff and just how important it is if you do hormone replacement therapy or testosterone replacement therapy, which in many cases um, can really improve your health. You really want to work with people that understand the intricacies of how hormones affect your body. Like for example, in men, when they do testosterone replacement therapy, they're replacing your testosterone. But if your estrogen as a result of it is too low or too high, you could feel like dog shit. You could have libido issues. You could have energy depression issues. There's also hormones up upstream from testosterone like DHEA, pregnenolone, and other hormones that can get affected. Um, and it's important. Here's the other thing that's important because I, I saw this discussion. I thought this was really, really cool. You, a, a particular testosterone level or hormone level make, make, may make one person feel good and another person not feel so good because of how you metabolize the hormone and the receptors that the hormone attaches to. So like if you're a man with a lot, like a really – a high density of androgen receptors is what testosterone attaches to a testosterone, you know, a, 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 a total testosterone of, level. Yeah. yeah. Like you may have a, a, a total testosterone level of 600 and you may feel amazing. If you're another guy and you have a low density of androgen receptor, uh, of androgen receptors, it may, re- you may require a total testosterone level of closer to a thousand to feel really good. So in, in the only way you'll know this or be able to do this is if you're working with, people that are doing your blood work who understand this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I'm so glad you brought this up because this is uh I've been a case of this, right? So um 
you know, I experimented with, with steroids in my early 20s, and all of mine come from, you know, either wor- word of mouth or on, researching on talking to people on forums or reading the steroid Bible. And so you can get an idea. Like, and I thought I had a pretty good idea of like, this is what I'm supposed to take when I'm taking it. This is what I'm supposed to take afterwards. But the problem with that, it's still generic information yeah. to your point right now. Mm-hmm. And I was one of those anomalies of like how much like uh, the anti-estrogen type of blockers I have to take to balance me out is way different. I know we're all on different, yeah. uh, this, we have to take different doses. Uh-huh. Uh, what I have to take is more than what you have to take to block that because my body produces more than you do. I wouldn't have known that had I not been working with them in the clinic and having them balance that all out. Yeah, well, remember when your estrogen was too low and and the side effects that yeah. you were feeling and you wouldn't have known. And you know what happens with that is if somebody doesn't know or if you're not working with really good doctors that monitor this and understand this, they may just lower your your testosterone or up your testosterone and not look at all these other balances. Like for example, high estrogen is different if your testosterone is high or low. It's the ratio oftentimes that makes a bigger difference. So if your testosterone is high because you're on replacement, then the amount of estrogen you may need to balance that out may be higher than what is what is normally considered normal or high or low. Um, and again, there's lots of different things that look like DHT levels and all these different things that you know you got to monitor in your body, and it's it can be very individual. It's so important. That's why, because you're seeing all these hormone replacement um, or therapy facilities pop up now. In fact, I mean, there's they'll, they'll there's places that you'll you'll do it online. They'll deliver it to your door. You don't really work with doctors or whatever. They make it really inexpensive, but you're dealing with hormones, yeah. and hormones are the signalers for your how you feel your moods, uh, I mean, so many different things. Well, this is part of, okay, this is what led us to, you know, you finding Dr. N and introducing him originally to me was, and I don't want to roll the company under the bus that I originally was working with, but they're a big company. They're a nationwide company that does hormone therapy. And one of the frustrations that I had was when I would come in to to, to test or my, my, week, my monthly checkup or whatever like that, um, I would be asking these types of questions and I couldn't get any answers because the person that was administering all to me was not somebody who was very w- well versed mm-hmm, in this. It mm-hmm. was just like a nurse that was certified to be able to give it to me. So I, I wasn't receiving the, the knowledge and the information that I was trying to get from having so, a, a, a professional place take care of me. That's one of the biggest differences about working with Dr. Rand and Dr. Todd is that I've been able to have access to them. And every time I have like a question, like, why do I feel this way? Or what do you think it's this? Like they have answers for me or they can, or they're troubleshooting with me versus what was happening to me at the other clinic was I wasn't getting any answers. And what I found like my, yeah. my, my little bit of knowledge was further than the person that was administering it to me. So I'm like, this sucks. I'm paying this premium to have a, a medical professional be the one that administers to me, but I can't get any any new information because I already know more than the person administering to me. I don't know me. of anybody or anywhere that's doing this in terms of, unless you're paying a premium to get access to that kind of a right. doctor to give you that kind of transparency and, you know, go through all that. So, yeah, I think it's, it's one of those things where it's, I think it, People don't realize how valuable this really is, and and where you can't really find something well, like this anywhere well, else. How your hormones affect you, and what's the right ratios and whatever for your body, um, is going to be different than it is for someone else. So it's like diet uh, or workouts. Like there's general truths, but the more individualized things become, the the better it is for you. And your hormones are <laughs> they're such an important part of your well being. And how you feel, like talk to anybody who's ever suffered from low thyroid or insulin issues, right? Or hormone imbalances. You, you just, it, it feels terrible. You don't know what the hell is going on. And you may think, I need more of this, need more of that, less of that. Like for example, there, there'll be men that will go on testosterone. Okay. So they'll replace their testosterone. They'll have a higher dose of testosterone. And then six months, a year into it, libido crashes. They can't, they, they, what the hell's going on? My testosterone's high. Why is my libido crap? Not realizing it may be, it may be their estrogen that's affecting. If it's too low, that'll give it, you know, that'll cr- crush that. Or if it's too high, that may crush that or some other issue. So it's, it, it makes a, a huge difference uh, to work with the, you know, with the right people. And I, I want to talk about that just because I think we oversimplify things. Like for example, I, I had yeah. a client once that went on uh, thyroid years ago, right? A long time ago. She had to go on thyroid medication because she had to have her thyroid removed. <clears throat> it took her a year to get the right dose of thyroid. 
And then when she did, she felt amazing. But she went between like too much, too low, other things being off or whatever. So just important, important. Well, and you, I mean, our community has free access to this. So if you if you're not on the you know uh, Mind Pump Hormones uh, Facebook forum, like you have to get on there. Yeah, and I, I would recommend this if you really want to take the next level. You go to mphormones.com, and they will evaluate. You can go and just get an evaluation, labs, everything, and they'll break everything down specifically for you. And then you can kind of see the difference, which also that reminds me of another thing. Um, I've talked about this before, but uh, the supplement, the amino acid L-carnitine mm -hmm. um, is one of the few things aside from strength training that has been shown to increase androgen receptor density. So if you want to, in a natural way, make the testosterone that you have more effective, you could supplement <clears throat> with L-carnitine. And that'll do. And there's different versions of L-carnitine. I like acetyl L-carnitine. It's one of the one of my favorite types. Live On makes that, and, and it's uh, very absorbable because it's got the uh, now what's the liposomes. The, what does the research say on? It? Is it something that uh, permanently affects it? Is it only affect it while I'm taking it? Is while you're it taking a, it, it's while you're taking it. While you're taking it, and then is it a a significant enough uh, difference that you should potentially be able to tell? I mean, is it? Do you know? Like, is it? That's a good question. The, I would imagine. This is me guessing. I imagine it depends on the individual. Depends on uh, the person, how much they're going to notice or how much they're going to feel. And imagine, I, so, and it's probably like everything else when you supplement. If you're somebody who's deficient or very low when it comes to androgen receptors, I would think that maybe yeah. you potentially feel that more versus somebody who has a a, a high amount. Now, when you when you did stuff with with uh, Doctor Rand, did they were they able to tell you if you are, or do they speculate? Oh, you probably have a bunch of a uh, high amount of receptors. What, what they do is they so there's a range. There's ranges that you have, right? Your your typical ranges that you'll get from the lab, and then they base it off of your symptoms, your perceived well being, uh, because that also you have to look at that as well, like. You know, I could train a client and be like, but this is the perfect workout and diet. And the client can be like, I feel like crap. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I ignore them. No, no, no. Don't worry. It's the perfect workout and diet. Let's just keep going. Stupid. You got to listen to the, pers the person's feedback. Like, okay, you're not getting good sleep. Maybe it's too high. Maybe, you're, maybe we're giving you too high of a dose. Maybe that's why you're getting some insomnia, for example. Or, you know, you feel this particular way. Let's look at these levels. Oh, it looks like in the upper level, you feel better. Or it looks like, and some people think the higher, the better. Not true. There's definitely people who had to reduce their dose and they felt better doing it. And this is all, you need this feedback. And then you need that with the labs so you can see the differences and the changes and associate it with the subjective feeling, connect the dots, boom. Now you have this individualized kind of perfect uh, type of approach. So anyway, speaking of our of uh, people that we work with, I'm excited. So I can't talk about this. I can't tell everybody what this is, but you know what I have right here? Oh, it's the what secret it? packet. This is so Organifi. Uh, we've been working with Organifi putting together, and I can't talk too much about it, but with a new product that we're kind of make, putting together. Can you not even tell what the kind of product it is? I can't say what it is, oh, wow. but we, I have the samples in here and I worked with them. So I did. So I get to try it today. We get to try it. Right. And it, we, I talked about, you know, what I want in there, what I want, you know, what it's for. Now, how many things get, got vetoed for you? Because I, because you've mm. learned that like, you can't just throw everything you want or else it'd be a $500 shake. I started with that. <laughs> so, I started with that. And then we worked it down to what would actually work. What wouldn't taste like absolute, like dog piss and, yeah. what, and what's uh, realistic. And I'm very happy with, <clears throat> with what we were able to put in there. Oh, okay. And there, I mean, Organifi's uh, tons of integrity too. So when I would yeah. say certain things, they'd say, well, efficacious dose is this. So, you know, why don't we try this instead? And I had some suggestions. We went back and forth. And so I'm excited. Now, to is this a, this initial trial that you, you have here right now for us to try? Is it flavorless right now? Or do you? No, it's already, flavored. Oh, it's already got a flavor. Yeah. So this is like, this is, we're going to test what the, what they think will the final product will be. Uh, okay. And they'll get our feedback or whatever. Uh, okay. Yeah. But they know how they are with flavor. They do really good with flavor. Yeah, I have yet to taste anything flavor. from them that doesn't. I agree. That doesn't taste, you know. Was it you that was saying they're in a retail store now? No. Yes. Yeah, yes oh, it was, was it? Yeah. yeah. Remember? Okay. So I brought it up on the show and I was wrong. It wasn't Whole Foods. It's Sprouts. Oh, Sprouts. Oh, wow. That's what it was. Yeah. yeah. Which is like right around the corner from the Whole Foods over uh, in this area. That and, and I was like, I know I just saw it. I yeah. saw it somewhere. It'd be cool to see it on the shelves. Yeah. Some of these major chains. Uh, you know, there's quite a few of our partners up. now. 
Yeah. It's, yeah, it's pretty cool to see uh, a lot of the brands that we started with years ago have now made their way into some of the, these major chains. I see Olipop in there. You see Pathwater all over the place. You see Magic Spoon. Magic Spoon is yeah. at Target oh, yeah. now. That's right. Yeah, there's, you're seeing um, a lot of the brands that um, we started working Fiori's with. Fiori's like prime time oh, commercials. Yeah. Oh, yeah. God, yeah, yeah, they're on. They're, they're, yeah, they're, they're running. a big player now. Yeah. Huge. Yeah. huge. What do you, what do you, Adam, what do you think about... because? the podcasting space is we're not it's not there yet but it's getting there to the point where it's going to be uh major retailers are going to be going in there to advertise yeah you know i don't i i go back and forth on how i feel about that you know to something that you have even thought about and we've talked about is um youtube is so big in comparison to podcasting yeah and what makes me think that we might not see that is that for advertisers like okay if you're if you're Coca-Cola um you're going to look at YouTube before you look at podcasting still even as great as podcasting especially is especially brand plays right yeah especially cuz it's just the pool is huge You're talking about billions of people versus hundreds of millions of people mm -hmm. it's a no brainer to to be in podcasting and what we're watching right now we're a part of this is this new wave of podcasting being a show on like YouTube so what might happen is the this podcasting just purely audio uh, may kind of stay around the same size, and where you might see the huge growth is on the video side of it. Well, so I mean that would still be advertising towards the podcasting direction, but it would be it would live more in the YouTube world. So I I, I mean I predict that's going to happen more. Well, Spotify is betting heavy that podcasting is going to be massively profitable for them. So I don't know if you guys saw their numbers. Mm -hmm. But they they profited as a company, but the vast majority of the profits is music. Hmm. They actually lost money on podcasts, on podcast. but they said we know this. Well, they're acquisition heavy right now. Yes, right? they said we know this, and <clears throat> but we predict that this could be a very profitable segment of our business. Yeah, I believe I read somewhere that they spent almost a billion dollars, like nine hundred and something million dollars on um, podcast acquisitions in the last few years. Mm -hmm. I mean, so obviously they're not making. A yeah, billion that's dollars the thing. Them. They got a lot to make up for for those uh, you know purchases. I mean, I I love Spotify. I think they have one of the best user friendly platforms. So I could totally see that. And then the fact that they are give you this option of like audio or video. I mean, that's what kind of makes it dynamic, right? So it's like you get the podcasting if you want to just listen to it or you have the, the video way, you know, of watching it. So I do think that that's pretty cool what they're doing. And I do think that Spotify's, I mean, I bought stock in them quite a while ago. Um, I mean, all stock sucks right now, but yeah, they're making a heavy bet on it. And yeah. I think that they're, I mean, I would, I mean, obviously I'm in the space, so I, I, I kind of agree with them um, yeah. that I think that I want they, to agree because what it looks like, what the, well, it doesn't look like they're quite transparent. They're trying to capture that market. Yeah. They want to be, and you know what? They're, they're, you're right. Their UI, like, because iTunes still gets more people. Yeah. But compare iTunes to Spotify. Well, I so much better. I think we're going to continue to see. Innovated very much. I mean, I think I think we talked about this a while back, um, and I've heard some people speculate on this, but it, it, I really think that creators are going to be treated more and more like athletes, um, where like there's so many streaming platforms right out there. Uh, both platforms and apps within platforms. So you get signed to a specific. Yes. Mm. So I, I think we're going to see more and more I mean, that makes sense. of the, like the, the top, the top of the top, like creator content creators um, getting acquired by these, these big mega companies. And then being exclusive. Yeah. Just like what we saw with Joe, Joe Rogan is just an example, like the big example that most people are, are aware of. Well, that but that's makes sense. It's already happening. Well, that's how music happens. That's how streaming video happens. <clears> right. <throat> it makes perfect sense that, uh, that a network would purchase a talent and say, because it draws people to their network. Right. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. So I think you're going to see, and I think it's going to be competitive. I think you're going to start seeing like creators. Like, I don't think we're far off from the idea that, um, you know, when Joe wrote, cause I think Joe Rogan's contract was only a couple years, mm -hmm. you know, maybe Spotify goes like, Oh, that was a lot of money. You know, yeah. you know, sure. It was nice to have him on here, but it, it was, so they don't, maybe they don't renew it. Or maybe somebody comes over the top. Maybe Amazon prime goes like, yeah. we'll give Joe 500 million mm -hmm. to come over to our place. So I think you're going to start to see as, as, as big, mega companies become more and more aware of the power of these communities that these creators are making. And they have it. Cause right now what the hardest part I think is, is measuring it mm. is how to value it. Mm. I mean, I think that you, it, it, and it's not as cut and dry as how many followers or listeners that you have. No, that's true. It's way more nuanced than that. I mean, we, we've experienced that with, with just the, the network of people that we have. 
that some people have millions of followers and they're terrible at, at converting revenue from that because the type of content that they create. Yeah, they don't have impact. Then you have small creators that have like a real small little fan base, but boy, they they monetize it really well because of the type of content mm -hmm. that they create for their community aligns really well with how they monetize. So yeah, I think they're I think these these mega companies are still trying to wrap their brains around, you know, how do we look at a Joe Rogan, a mind pump or a, a business like that and make them a, a legitimate offer that, oh, you know what? We'll give you all this money to come over our platform and walk away from these others. I think we're still trying to figure that out right yeah, now. Yeah, I mean Howard Stern is still on serious uh XM and I'm like, do people even listen to serious XM? He got he had the uh, I think his deal was even bigger than Joe Rogan's back in the day. For that. well, his was like a ten-year deal, right? Yeah, it was he a had a ma look at that up. Actually, I haven't looked up his his deal in a long time because it was a big deal when he did. Yeah, that. It was, but it's like I mean, terrestrial radio is still a thing. And yep. like you're bringing that up to me the other day. I'm like, wow, that's interesting. That there's it's still got plenty of pool uh, out there in the market. Yeah, we were all talking about, we were speculating about this. My, my speculation on it, even though I have, I have no idea cause I actually haven't read anything on this would be that they did something with the car companies that really kept them afloat for this long. Uh -huh. They did. When you first get a car, yeah, you get an automatic like free subscription. Why haven't they done that with podcasts yet? Well, they got a corner of that market. Yeah. yeah but the, I, you know, it radio people, more people still listen to radio. But as cars start to allow you to hook up your phone, get more streaming in there, it's just going to change. I would love to see the numbers on that. I've yeah. heard you say that before, and, and I and I know that's true or was true at least three or four years ago, but boy, it's got to be shifting. It now. is totally shifting. Look, talk to anybody under the age of 19, and they, would, they can't name a single radio anything or a single network anything or movie star, but they'll tell you YouTube stars, they'll yeah. tell you streaming stars, they'll tell you what's on YouTube. You know, well, even the stuff. day that the, the yep. DJs, remember how, how popular and how big of a deal it would be to be like a radio DJ back in the days? Like it's just, that's not, they're not popular. Yeah. Like so that I've anymore. been on, I've been on obviously lots of podcasts, but I've been on two live, I guess you could call them radio shows. Very different. Really interesting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You yeah. only have those like quick, uh, what is it? Like a five minute little blurb that you have and then cut to commercial. Yeah. Break. But I, so I like the pressure. So I have fun with it. Yeah. Right. Cause I'm like, all right, we're on. Right. And you can't, it's live. So yeah. you got to go. It's not like they're going to cut it, edit it, record it, you know, uh, or, and release it later. But it's funny cause you'll have their producer come on. All right, Sal, you have, uh, we got 15 seconds till we're on. And then you'll, you'll be quiet and they'll be like five, four, <laughs> and then nothing. Three. Yeah, you see that, and you go, it's like, whoa, this is so weird. It's live, dude. You're on. Let's rock and roll. I want to do like Kanye. Remember what Kanye did on, what was it, the MTV Music Awards when they were live? And he comes out, and he goes, George Bush doesn't like black people. George Bush doesn't care about black people. Everybody's like, whoa! <laughs> just say some Cut random, it off, yeah, just say some shit. Yeah. Black <laughs> <laughs> and they couldn't do anything about it because it was Lizard live. people are running the country. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Sal Stefano. Yeah. Lizard people run the country. No, they cut it off. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. that's good time. Doug, are you Googling over there? I want to know the stats on the radio stuff. Are you Googling or are you uh, searching No, I'm else? preparing episodes here for future oh. recordings. Oh, oh, boy. Doug. Andrew, maybe you are we'll over there. We got two producers. Yeah, no one yeah. fucking Googling for us. <laughs> Jesus, dude. Wow. We'll get this another is, guy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah all right. I was really interested about the radio stats. Yeah. Like, I, I know that I've read that before and and i know you're right that uh, it was still dominant but man that was years ago when i read that it'd be interesting to see how many people are streaming uh their their music than we're listening to traditional radio now yeah. i've, I've got to think a very small percentage i'm googling it right now uh 2022 radio reaches 92 percent of adults in, in the U.S. every week, 41. Yeah, so it's still a big, I mean. Okay, so, but do they, because what's happening is a lot of these, these like even like news is doing this, news and radio, is they're also streaming it. You mean the numbers for streaming? Yeah, like is that, because you said radio reaches 90 mm. some percent. Well, so, here, here, uh, okay, so radio is the leading reach platform. So that's what this says. I know, but here's here's my point. I'm like, okay, so I, I listen to like KMBR, right? Which does like sports talk radio and stuff like that. If I don't catch it at six o'clock in the morning on a commute drive, I can still go listen to it streamed. That's true. So do they mm. count that? No, as, I think they're listening to literally broadcast. So check this out. Like maybe go Google yeah, live like, radio. I no, I got radio this for you. Okay, no, I'm here. on the set. So okay. more than 244 million American adults listen to the radio each month. There's only 100 million podcast listeners total, around 100 million. So that just goes to show you right there. Uh, adults uh, 50 and older, 114 million, obviously older people. But remarkably, 18 to 34, 71 
uh, million adults, 18 to 34, use radio each month. I think it's just free. It's yeah, there. But, it's in your car. Yeah, but you don't think that they're counting what I'm saying? I know what you mean. Um, I don't think so. I think it's just broadcast. I don't think it's through. But you know what? That would be, you're right, because they would count it as radio still, right? Of course, because it's, it's, yeah. it's, it is it's radio. still getting a listen. It's just that you're able to stream it later on. So I think that's how they've stayed alive and competitive mm. is because of that. Is not, so if you, if you built an audience already, right? You and especially with the older generation, and but now you just allow them to access it whenever they want. Because I will, like, if I want, so after like a, a game, right? So the Warriors mm -hmm. play tonight. I I consume a lot of talk radio mm -hmm. afterwards because I like to hear all the analysts break down the game and debate some shit, and like so. And my buddies and I, we all argue over who's more right. Blah blah. It's just like our thing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but now because of streaming, it's nice because I don't have to like. For example, right after the game is when like those live interviews happen. And a lot of times it's like, it's time for bed or I got to go do something else. So I don't want like, we, okay, we all watch the game together. Yeah. What you guys don't know is I later on went and streamed all the live follow up, the live interviews yeah. later on. So does that get counted towards that radio station that streamed or that? that well, so that I got, so I just did, a, I just looked this up. So this is actually kind of interesting. I did not know this. As recently as 2017, radio was the most popular method for listening to music, but it's now switched. So streaming has now sur surpassed. Wow, just from 2017. Yeah, so 2017, 36% of people listened to music through the radio and 32% through streaming. Today, it's 31% radio, 41% streaming. That's only going to wow. accelerate. Yeah. And that's music, right? So, uh, I mean, podcasting's got to kind of follow something along the line. Well, it's interesting. I've seen deals now where they have like a brand new series coming out, but immediately they package in a, a podcast with that. Mm. So that way they can have sort of the round robin discussions yeah. and all that. Like you saw a little bit of that with like, I know there was like Walking Dead and they had like the, the fear or, or whatever the show was called, like right after that, that just like, basically Fear caught, the walking dead. yeah they talked about all the theories and just like where it was going and uh and they've done this with a lot of uh, new shows that they're bringing out now where the the studios are are um bringing in that that podcast at, at the same time so that way like fans know like this is going to be like all a package deal well right now so draymond green is like blowing up so there's a there's a, a um a, a streaming platform or a, like a company, excuse me, called the volume that's been around for quite a while on YouTube. And I was unaware of it until Draymond started his show. And because what he's doing, like, so he is like, while the season is going, he's podcasting, which no one's done this yet. Hmm. So like after the game, God, that's so smart at midnight, yeah. this dude is ripping a podcast, like breaking down the game. That is smart. Oh, what just smart, happened. Yeah. And it is like, it's, so he just started it this season. It's and probably, it, is it crushing? Oh, it's crushing. Yeah. It's becoming some, they're now like ESPN and everyone's talking about what he's talking about on there because that's what everybody wants. Everybody wants to feel like I just watched the game and I get to hear one of the best people break down what just happened in the game. Mm -hmm. And nobody is really capitalizing on that market as well as he's and or from his perspective mm. right there's other analysts that are like you know just talking heads that aren't in the game well that's a whole different that's whole totally different yeah it's so weird there's so many options like even uh the manning brothers like them doing like the caddy to like yeah uh, some of the games is like really entertaining it's to becoming to them. it's becoming really popular to do that Have you see what you know he's talking about mm. where like while monday night football is going on you now get like this you can stream the game and at the same time, you've got, you know, Peyton Manning and uh, Eli Manning, the two brothers, two quarterback, you know, Hall of Fame quarterbacks, right, that are talking to each other. And then they normally have like a random guest that'll yes. go in there and they're like narrating the game. So you're watching the game, but also hear, hearing their commentary wow. from their perspective and people are eating it up wow. like crazy. It's, so. a, it's a matter of time. It's yeah. going to be, I mean, we're looking at probably five to 10 years and streaming is going to dominate such a big way broadcast is going to be totally well it has totally everything nice. you get everything that you want from live broadcasting except for at, at your time at your and, convenience and way more individualized right because you, you could find so many shows that cater to you whereas when you did broadcast it was a limited you had a limited amount of channels and limited amount of ways to put stuff out so they had to appeal to such a broad audience whereas you know you could put out a podcast that's like you know, women with thyroid issues, right? You would never see that on broadcast, but it may crush uh, on streaming enough to to really warrant that they. Well, if you do on. a good job, you will literally capture everybody who wants. That's help what I mean. That. Yeah, that's what's great about yeah. it. Yeah, no.
All right, I got to tell you guys about a company called Z Biotics. This is a genetically modified probiotic drink designed to help your body break down acetaldehyde. All right, so why is this important? Well, when you drink alcohol, some of that alcohol is broken down in your gut. That breakdown turns into acetaldehyde, it gets in your bloodstream, and then your liver eventually breaks it down. But meanwhile, when it's in your bloodstream, it can create a lot of havoc, it can create a lot of problems in your body. So what z does when you drink it before you drink alcohol is these little bacteria have been designed to break down acetaldehyde in your gut. So every time you drink alcohol, have a drink, glass of wine, whatever, have z so you can help your body out. This stuff is amazing. I use it all the time. Very effective stuff. I almost never drink any alcohol without it. So go check them out. Head over to zbiotics.com. That's Z B I O T I C S dot com forward slash mind pump. And then use the code mind pump 22 for 10% off your first order. All right. Here comes the rest of the show. First question is from Synergy620. Should I focus more on getting my squat lower before adding weight, or can I get lower while going heavier? Yeah. So a, a lot of people think that progressive resistance mm. simply means adding weight to the bar, but progressive resistance just means the, the weight feels heavier or is more challenging. And you can do that which by just adding range of motion. Like right. if you could squat 150 pounds to parallel um, and then you go down two or three more inches, that weight's going to feel a lot heavier. So you, if you're going to go lower you go lower before you add weight. Don't do both because what you're doing is you're adding two additional things on top of each other. They become cumulative and you're asking for uh, for trouble. But I would go lower before adding weight all day long. Well, I guess it really depends on where you're currently at too though, right? Mm -hmm. Like if someone's, uh, they can't even break parallel or they're just barely at parallel, then yeah, I would be pushing my range of motion first mm -hmm. before I add weight. But maybe somebody's already got a pretty deep squat, but they're yeah. trying to get even deeper. Like, you know, so it's, I guess it's kind of, a little bit of a nuanced answer on But you which wouldn't one. want to do both at the same time. No, no, that's definitely not. And not only that, I actually wouldn't do like so let's say I squat like you said 150 parallel and then I get two more inches with 150. I actually wouldn't go two more inches with the 150. I'd go two more inches with 90 pounds. Right. And get good at 90 pounds. That's two a good inches point. Deep. So in fact, mm -hmm. you should go lighter. Yes. Get the deeper range of motion and then go back to your normal way. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and the way I was hearing this and, and I I don't know if like you guys were hearing this at all, but like in terms of like loading it, it forcing you to because of the load it would it would help your squats naturally to go a little lower which doesn't happen it's actually the opposite right if you mm -hmm. add more weight you're more resistant to going lower because you inherently you know you're not gonna be able to dig out of there yeah uh, at, you know with as much force so uh that's not gonna help you get lower in in terms of like uh, adding weight to the bar but um yeah if you really want to focus on gaining more range of motion um, that that is something you can pursue. Uh, you, you're going to definitely want to yeah. lighten. You know load. what I what I do like about this question is it it does present um, something that this kind of this mental game that you have to play when you've decided, or at least what I had to. Um, you know, I got a pretty good. I had a pretty strong squat, relatively strong for being a tall, lanky guy. I had a decent squat, um, but I, I I hadn't really worked on my mobility, and then I decided to work on my mobility, and. I remember how humbling it was to have to to pull all that weight off of course. and really, really work on the range of motion. And had I been focused on, you know, okay, I've gotten good deeper. Like how quick can I get back up to the 400 pound club? If I was focused on that, I probably would have had some major setbacks where I actually, when I decided that I was going to really work on my squat depth, you know, and my hip mobility and my ankle mobility, because that's what, what that's because that's really more important than squat depth. I think we should actually uh, talk about too. It's uh, it's probably less about the, you just going deeper, and there's probably a limiting factor to why you can't go deeper, and that's where the time and energy should mm -hmm. really be. So when I went through that, I just completely let go of you know trying to be the strong guy in the gym or trying to be even the strong version of me. It's like I want to be the mobile version of me. So I'm not going to really focus on how much weight I'm I'm going to choose a weight always mm -hmm. that I can safely move in this range of motion. And I'm just dedicated to getting, you know, a, a deeper range of motion in my squat, which means, yeah, I'm squatting with li lighter weight and deeper. And then I'm also putting a bunch of work into my ankles, putting a bunch of work into my hips and just repeating that over and over and over and not really being concerned about weight. It's really tough to kind of juggle both. Yeah. I mean, so long as, uh, you know, everything's within reason. If the tension is high, meaning it feels challenging, 
less weight with a greater range of motion is more beneficial than more weight with a shorter range of motion. Now, I say this within reason because obviously you can go too extreme and, you know, do crazy stuff. But, you know, within good form, good technique, and again, within good reason, if you have to choose between the two, then the better range of motion with better form is going to give you better results. And it's also lower risk, so long as you do it right, of injury long term than adding more weight. And and the, the challenge with this is ego. Um, yep. It was for me. It still can be for me, even at, at, at my age. But definitely when I was younger, like, okay, do I go deeper or do I add 20 pounds to the bar? I think I'll add 20 pounds to the bar because yeah. it looks cooler. And I can say yeah. that I lift, lifted more weight. <laughs> uh, and studies are pretty good on this. You know, if, if this wasn't the case, by the way, then – the most effective workouts would be very short ranges of motion with as much weight as you can lift. So it would be, and there was a book, I've talked about this in the past. There was this book that came out in the nineties where there was this, I don't know if it was a scientist or a bodybuilder and they came out and they said, Hey, you know, it's all about tension. So let's just go short ranges of motion and load as much weight as possible. So like your bench press would be like, you know, four inches and just load it. And because it's so much heavier, you're going to stimulate more muscle. Well, it went nowhere because that's not how it works. The range of motion plays a big role and how your body adapts. So you're better off, again, all within reason, aiming for that than always adding weight to the bar. Next question is from Alvaro Gon22. What are some very explosive movements or compound lifts that really help with explosive and speed training? All right, so there's two things here. One is increasing your strength, just overall strength, generally will make you more explosive um, it, it, with your movement. So if you if your squat goes up, and I say generally, because this isn't at some point you start to get diminishing returns, okay? But if you take the average person, just make them stronger, they're gonna have more explosive power uh, as well. Now, that being said, you have to consider, when you're training specifically for explosive power and you're doing explosive movements, in terms of the hierarchy of skill that's involved with lifting, explosive movements are at the top. Yeah. Meaning you need the most skill and the best control and the best mobility to do those effectively versus slow and controlled. So this is, and I say that because people need to be careful because they go to explosive training and they mm -hmm. try and do an exercise that they can't do very well slow, then they try and do it fast and you're asking for trouble. So I like to do explosive movements that unless I'm training someone who's really athletic and has the time to really perfect you know, these high skill movements, I like to take movements that require the least amount of skill and do them explosively to minimize that. So like mm -hmm. rather than doing, for example, like a, a snatch with the barbell, I may do like a kettlebell swing, right? Yeah. So similar kettlebell swing, still high skill. If or you do drive the sled. Or yeah, you know, stuff that requires less skill so that I could do it explosively. Right. Otherwise, the, the risk of injury is just, it's just too well, high. I, you know, I w we get questions like this quite a bit. This, uh, they're always worded a little bit different or whatever. But, you know, something that would help uh, our audience when they send questions like this is actually tell me the sport. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. that makes a difference too. Because I, the the explosive type training I would want to do for uh, the – would be different per sport. And I know this person is asking because they want like generic type of exercises. Like yeah. Like, is it, would the snatch be great for this or would be, you know, this, a box jump be better for that? They want like this generic exercise that would translate best to sport, but what will translate best to your sport is very specific movements for your sport done explosively. Yeah. That is going to make you a better athlete on the field or on the track or whatever. The, somebody who's doing track, somebody who's doing football, somebody who's playing soccer, to me, the explosive training uh, potentially looks different. Yes, there might be some yeah. similarities of some of the drills you do, but the most bang for your buck type of exercises are going to be very specific to that sport. Yeah, my thoughts around this has changed over the years and talking to like world-class coaches and how they deal with this kind of risk-reward ratio in terms of like explosive training and um, because when you get into Olympic lifts, obviously there's like a learning uh, curve to that as well. Like how long do I have with athletes to be able to really establish something that um, has any kind of benefit to it in terms of like, is there skill? Can I develop this skill with this athlete in that adequate amount of time in order for that to then translate for yeah. them into the uh, actual season play? Uh, so you, you kind of like look at it all in terms of uh, what you can accomplish uh, within this timeline. And so that's how I would start to kind of structure that in and what they really wanted to get out of it. And so a lot of times just a, a, a jump in place yeah. is going to be your best option because it's all triple extension, it's super explosive. Everything's about acceleration. You have to organize your entire body to pull this one thing off. And that's 
really what you're you're simulating with weight in all those other scenarios, whether it's left to right, whether it's vertically, uh, in you know, in, in terms of like the velocity that you're in force generation that you're trying to accomplish with it, you can do that within throws. You can do that within kettlebell swings. You can do that within, uh, you know, medicine ball tosses. Uh, it, there's a variety of options for that, but really what it, what it amounts to is, um, you know, what, what specific skill are you trying to acquire in this time frame, And then like, what are you gonna be able to pull off? And then how much risk are you going to add into that, uh, to, to gain? I, read. I love that you brought that up. In fact, anybody who is listening to this question or this, this applies to them should go listen to the interview that you did with Joe DeFranco on Joe DeFranco's platform, because this was a big a big chunk of the conversation yeah, wasn't just around what are great exercises, but how do you train a kid or a group of kids that are getting ready for a season and they're at the level that they're at to give them the biggest bang for their buck, but then also not risk serious injury or no, or, or just waste time with the skill. Yeah. Right. Learning mm -hmm. curve, right? Like teaching a, teaching a freshman kid in school, how to do a, a clean and jerk may take you the whole year to get the, the mechanics down and you're not going to reap any benefits from that. Not as far as on the field right. where it's simply doing a tuck jump or like you guys talked about isometric, uh, an isometric lunge hold in a position that you can do with a whole group setting, like the carryover that you're going to get for that, for their, that, that will transfer right away for them in, on the football field is going to be more beneficial than maybe exercises that would be that and this is where studies get like yes this is where like a study would show i know exactly where you're going on, yeah huh? like a, like a study will show like a you know a triple extension type exercise right or a, like a snatch yeah a snatch or a clean like oh my god it's off the charts that what you get from that and so that's what that like these coaches and people think or even like you know listeners and they go well i was told this or i read this study and this study shows this or i study nerds that love to, to to point to that stuff it's like okay well what you're not factoring in is this kid's fucking 16 years old he's not done any of this stuff before he's got six months before the season mm -hmm. i've got to make an impact as a coach to make him a better player on the field right away am i really gonna fucking spin you know, the next six months trying to teach him how to do this with a PVC pipe, knowing mm -hmm. that he may not even get it by that time, much less get it and then actually be able to progress it to actually transfer any skills on the on the on the field. Right. Like you don't people don't think about that. Stuff. No, I, I like what you said exactly. about just a regular jump, a regular jump in place. By the way, that's also I, I want to be clear, requires a certain level of skill because you could take you take your average middle aged client. 37 year old, you know, 40 year old, you know, mom or dad or whatever. And they come in and they're like, I want to get explosive. And then you have them just jump as high as they can. And they don't, they haven't jumped since they were, you know, in, you know, in, in middle school yeah. or played sports that also requires a certain level of skill and you'll get injured. We'll break that down. You know, mm -hmm. like, I mean, even just landing and landing softly yes. and, you know, being able to control your body and getting full extension at the peak of your jump. And mm -hmm. like, there's just, there's a lot more little nuance in there than people realize. Yeah, well, not, nonetheless though, I yeah. would say generally speaking, a jump in place is an, is a great place to build explosive power because yeah. it requires less skill than all the other explosive movements that I can think of. You'll get a good carryover unless you want to dedicate a long time to learning how to do some of these incredible. Olympic well, the other lifts. one that I would add to that is, and, and this is, you know, give credit where it's due, uh, Joe DeFranco, the sled. Yep. I mean, I, I think that's why he went that direction. Totally I, where he was. Because it was because, fast. Yeah. The carryover because, right away. Exactly. Because he figured that out because he was actually out there in the trenches really helping all these young athletes try and get better at their sport. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, I know all those studies, what they show about this, you know, the snatch and what it could do for them. But what I realize is that I'm training a group of kids at a very young age that don't have the time to build that. Mm -hmm. What I could do is I could put them on a sled, very low risk. Low and, risk, low skill. Yes. Low risk, low skill, lots of carryover. Lots of carryover. Right to Immediate. many many sports yeah. right so um that i would i would push a kid in that direction is you know i mean there and there's a tremendous amount of exercises that you can do with that sled with lightweight slow heavy grinding weight go pulling the sled mm -hmm. pushing the sled Sprints lateral with yeah. stuff with the sled i mean there's so many great things that you can do with a sled for an athlete that will carry over into most sports. yeah but consider this if you can't do an exercise perfectly slow with good with high tension you're not gonna be able to do it fast uh, with low tension because like if I did a really good deadlift perfectly and then I go, I'm going to go light and do it explosively. Now I'm including speed and deceleration, which I didn't deal with when I was going heavy, even with perfect form. So consider this when you're doing explosive movement of all the ways to train your body. The one that requires the most consideration 
is explosive training because it's fast. So, and if the, when things happen fast, if there's a little bit of a breakdown, you can multiply it times 10 in terms of how it can affect your body. Next question is from Micah2448. What are some of your favorite and most effective modes of exercise outside of resistance training? Oh, uh, personal, I guess. Um, I mean, for me, it's 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 got to be, well, generally being active. But when I do, you know, kind of targeted mobility, active stretching, I get a huge benefit from that. And I, th I think for me personally, I just generally am tight. So for me, I get just a huge benefit from doing that. And for clients, I also saw a huge benefit from them doing that as well. When they would do kind of targeted active stretching, targeted mobility. Now, now, and I saw great benefits from for them as well. But now, now the question is why? Why would you see such great benefits? Because it made the resistance training more effective. Mm -hmm. That's why. Because resistance training is so effective at giving you good results, at giving you general health and helping you get leaner and sculpt your body and all that stuff, that the stuff you do outside of that, if you can pick something that will make that more effective, like if you could do, if you could pick something that will make your resistance training more effective, then you're, pro you're, you're, you're probably picking something that's going to give you the most bang for your buck. So I'm going to give a lame old man answer. <laughs> so young me would be like basketball, wakeboarding, snowboarding. Yeah, those yeah. are all my favorite things. And they will still, I still love all those things and would include that into this. But what I would say has been uh, one of the biggest for me, uh, and, and this was a shift in my life in the last 10 years or less, and that's walking. Yeah. Um, I figure you're going there. And, and I just... It was not something that I ever focus on, and I focus a lot on it now. In fact, we, I mean, Katrina and I were at uh, Roy's yesterday, one of our favorite places to eat over in Pebble Beach. And, um, you know, we've trained ourselves to do this, not just for the exercise part, but also for the conversation that we have and the beautiful view and being present yeah. in the moment and getting disconnected from electronics. I've just found so many positive things to connect to just going. For, and it's easy. We could do it for three hours. If you really, I mean, you want to go for a nice long hike. You don't need to put workout clothes on. That's right. Anything. And I could just go for a long walk and just enjoy great conversation and the scenery. And you would be blown away. By the way, a long three-hour stroll along the beach will burn way more calories than the most intense one-hour workout you've done. That's how beneficial it mm -hmm. is from a calorie burn perspective, which everybody measures as their success of their, their workout. And, and you get all these other side benefits like that I'm talking about with the connection with my partner, with being disconnected from the, the electronics, from the enjoying the views. Super low risk of, of injury. Yeah. yeah. So it's become something that I just, and it's so easy for me to get motivated to go do it. Right, obviously, getting ready to go down, go to put on my basketball shorts and go play basketball requires me to do some stretching and mobility work and get ready for all that and drive to a court and find a court and find someone to play with. Mm -hmm. Like that takes a lot of energy. It's really easy to talk myself out of some of those other modalities of of exercise, which I love and I, I'm, all, I'm all pro. Walking is so easy. It's yep. so easy not to talk myself out of it. Like you said, I cannot have the greatest shoes for it, the greatest outfit for it. it doesn't matter. All I'm doing is walking. Yep. So that's my old that's man a good answer. Pick. Yeah, I mean, since you already covered mobility, which would be would been my pick as well, it's kind of basically, I guess you'd classify this as resistance training as well, but I don't think people uh, really think about this in their thought process of like uh, rotational movements. For me, grabbing tools like Indian clubs or like unconventional tools like a mace bell, um, just working on that type of throwing uh, circular type movement um, is is just something I've implemented uh, over the years, and I, it doesn't take a lot of thought for me now because I've been able to kind of work on the technique and the the skill of it. Where I just pick it up and I start swinging. Uh, it doesn't have to be programmed into my workout. Like I just do that because I know what I know what I'm doing is I'm I'm reinforcing um, that priority with my body to be able to uh, protect and, and re like uh, to stabilize and mobilize uh, my shoulder joint. It's just been amazing because I've, I've avoided so much pain and, and my abilities in the gym have, have uh, um, definitely uh, gotten better in terms of like my pressing ability and also my uh, uh, what I do with, with any kind of movement with that upper body. It's been really helpful. I yeah. love that answer, Justin. And you know, this funny thing about, of myself and my fitness journey is so, something really gets solidified or I really piece it together when I, when I do something consistently and then I stop doing it and you then tell I, the difference yeah. and then I, and then I see where I get fucked up or something bad. Like, so for example, to your point, 
um, I've really tried to adopt that from you. Like I, you've always been really like you. And I, I actually was on a kick for a while there. I, you probably remember there was a time there where you would see me swinging the club, swinging the mace in here pretty frequently. It was doing stuff at home like that. Just trying to get in the habit of doing rotational stuff that I just don't really do inside my workouts or my daily life anymore because I'm not as active or I'm not as athletic as I used to be. And I fell off of doing that. Well, just recently on the podcast, I shared, and you guys know, like, boy, I got tore the fuck up just shoveling, shoveling some sand for freaking, you know, when I was when I broke the glass and uh -huh. I had to show because I haven't done anything rotational in in quite some time. And I really think that had I been continuing to do swinging that mace club and stuff like that around my my core stability and strength and rotational strength would have been there way better than had it been, had I mm -hmm. stopped and then went and did something abnormal like that. Mm -hmm. And it just highlighted that for me, like, God, I can get back into swinging the mace again, like I was before. And like you said, it's so simple. You can just grab it real quick, swing it around for 10 minutes. You don't have to do a crazy workout. No, either. not yeah. at all. Now I do want to say this for the average person, the most important thing you can do outside of your resistance training or strength training, this is the criteria. What do I enjoy doing? Mm -hmm. And what am I most likely to be the most consistent doing? Because whatever that is, that's going to be the best thing. Yeah. Bottom line. Which is why I push towards the walking. Totally. I, I feel yeah. like it's that's for most it's, people. That's it right there. Right. Next question is from Cami cake 21. What old school training techniques should make a comeback? Yeah, uh, what a timely question. So I was reading mm -hmm. an article today about Eastern European bodybuilders. Okay. And how they train differently than Western bodybuilders or American bodybuilders. Now at the moment you're starting to see some Eastern American, uh, Eastern excuse me, European bodybuilders make progress in pro bodybuilding and do really well. So people are like, oh, how do they lift or whatever? They do a double split routine, and because in Eastern Europe there was such a, they were such like Olympic lifting, like it, you know during the Cold War the Eastern European countries, the, the Soviet countries just crushed uh, the rest of the world in Olympic lifting. So they have a lot of that influence. So how do they work out? They do practice kind of strength-based training in the morning. And then at night they come back and do kind of more bodybuilding style training. Now, what does this have to do with this question? Even here in the U S uh, back in the day, bodybuilders did a lot of double split routines. I think splitting up your workout, uh, that is a, it's, first of all, it is a, a classic old school training technique. Hmm. There's tremendous value in doing that tremendous value. Now, of course the issue is you got to work out twice a day instead of once a day. However, if you can do this, uh, I think you get better results. Take Even taking your normal workout and cutting in half, doing half in the morning and half at night. I've done this before. My performance is better. My recovery is better. My ability to handle load and handle volume and whatever, so much better. This is something I think more people should, should experiment with. Um, and then uh, to counter the argument of, well, time is an issue. You know, for some people, it's easier to do two 20 minute workouts or two 30 minute workouts than it is to do one 45 minute or one, one hour workout. So for some people it actually works better schedule wise, but that would be my pick hundred percent. So, well, I'm going to stick with, and it's probably still Justin's answer before him and stay with the, the mace bell and Indian club direction, because I just think that, and that this, that's old, old school. That's before uh, most any of the stuff that we see in our gyms today. Right. Um, and I just think it has tremendous value, especially for the, sh I mean, when I look back at my my client portfolio of all the people that I've trained, um, how many of them had just limited range of motion in their shoulders and the ability and their hips? Like mm -hmm. it was like just areas that just end up and at, at a relatively early age too. Like I'm talking about forty year old clients, fifty year old clients that lose this ability to do very basic stuff because they stopped moving that way, and we we all kind of naturally do it as kids when we're hanging on monkey bars and we're playing sports and throwing balls and do so that. And then we all get into work life and you just kind of forget about that stuff. And you, and then you always just say, well, that's when I was young or, you know, you always go back to like giving, making the excuse of you being older. What it really is, is that we just stop, stop doing that movement. And it's such an important part of staying healthy and functional long, long term. So I think, that those need to make a comeback because it's it's so complementary 
to regular traditional strength training we all talk about. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think uh, another one, and maybe Justin's even, I'm, yeah. I don't want to steal this from you, isometrics. Is that where you're going? Yeah, I was- <laughs> We'll be well, doing nothing, bro. <laughs> no, yeah, I was I was actually thinking a little bit different, but yeah, isometrics for sure. I'm like, you know, the isometric evangelist. I'm the rotational, you know, evangelist. I'm constantly trying to harp on those uh, it, to, to make them more popular because it's so beneficial and like just people just overlook- the um the carryover that that brings and what that does to like you know fulfill a lot of like needs your body has um but you know what i was actually thinking because it's old school like i was just thinking of like some trainers i know that um have brought some of these old techniques like especially for training uh any kind of explosive athletes or boxers specifically like i know this guy ross i forget his last name training but like he has a lot of his clients working outside in in the elements a lot uh, and, you know, running outside in real dirt and like, you know, chopping trees. And so it, you saw this kind of make a resurgence uh, when when CrossFit and like some of these like garage gyms like were popping up mm -hmm. everywhere and people were doing tire strikes and stuff with the sledgehammer, which is all right. But honestly, like uh, laterally, like chopping trees, like in terms of like core and, and hips and, and generating power and force and then velocity um, has like an amazing carryover for athletes. And I think that's something that's totally overlooked. Huge. I, I do, I do want to touch back on isometrics because isometrics was a staple of training back in the day. It was a, it, like everybody used mm -hmm. isometrics as part of the training because they saw tremendous value and it fell out of favor. And that's too bad because of all the things that we just talked about. Okay. If you look at the studies, if you talk about double split routines and using, you know, rotational movements with Indian clubs and mace spell and, you know, like you said, the kind of lateral, you know, explosive movements or whatever. Look at the studies on those. All good, all good stuff. Compare them to the studies on isometrics. It doesn't even hold a candle. Yeah. Isometrics, the, the studies on isometrics, if you're not sold on it, look them up. There's almost There's nothing a that ton. will- Oh my God. It, the, 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 what it will do for your body in terms of strength- power, muscle control from one thing. And then, and then here's the crazy part. This is what's crazy about this. It's very unique about uh, this, what I'm talking about. Very minimal damage to the body. There's almost nothing that will produce those results, but also not hamper your recovery that much. So isometrics, like that is a, for most people, if you do it right and you program it right, game changer for your routine. And the old school strength athletes knew this. They did this all the time. Yeah, you can target problematic areas in your lifts better than any other uh, modality. Like if you focus on the isometrics and really, um, you know, lasering in on on where the dysfunction lies or where the, the drop of, of production is happening, that's something that you can immediately improve. And again, less dam like no damage. Uh, you can always let off uh, and, and it's all like self-generated. So it's, it's just one of the more safer uh, modalities out there and very effective. Totally. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at MindPumpJustin. Adam is on Instagram at MindPumpAdam. And you can find me on Twitter at MindPumpSal.